Welcome to the Twinkle Talks EYFS podcast. Working in the early years is busy, funny, messy and exhausting. Join me, Shana, and the rest of the Twinkle EYFS team as we talk honestly about our experiences as practitioners, teachers and professional nappy changers. Whether you're listening to increase your CPD hours or catching up on our antics whilst driving home from work, Twinkle EYFS will share everything you need to know about all things early years. Hello, wonderful listeners. It is great to be back in 2023 for another episode of Twinkle Talks EYFS. It's me, Shana, and we have got a special treat for you today because we have got a Nursery World Award winner. As a guest today, I'm so excited to introduce you to her. But before we get there, we're going to start this year with a brand new segment. We're going to call it Twinkle Talks Top 3. So it's like the quadruple T's. That that doesn't that doesn't sound as catchy. So what we do is we'll put out a poll on our social media where you can join in and tell us about your top 3 of a subject. So we started the year off with Twinkle Talks Top 3 Biscuits. Let's have a look at the results. <laughs> Okay, so we had lots of applicants come in for this one. We had digestives, custard creams, ginger nuts, uh, hobnobs, dark chocolate digestives, it's important to be specific here, uh, shortbread, rich tea, malted milk, party rings, how did party rings get in there? Not, not a fan. Jammy Dodgers, ew, also not great. Uh, Pink Panther Wafers, for me, star of the show, but 453 of you took part in this poll. So let's have a look at the results. In third place, it is Custard Cream. Oh, fair enough. In second place, it's the Bourbon. I mean, it's chocolate wafer with chocolate cream. How can you go wrong? I'm impressed. And in first place, it's got to be the Chocolate Digestive. Of course it is, I'm not sure. That's much of a surprise. A massive 26% of you voted for Chocky Digestive as the top one. I'm actually really surprised. The ones that got the least amount of votes is Rich Tea at 0.4. I love a Rich Tea. Malted Milk, 0.6% of the vote. I've got to agree there, it is pretty gross. 1% only voted for the party ring. I'm also really shocked to see that shortbread only got 2% of the vote. I mean, I don't know. There's something wrong there. We need to demand a recount. Demand a recount. But that's all for this week's Twinkle Talks Top 3. I wonder what it'll be next time. Make sure you get involved on social media and have your say. Well, there you have it. Chalky Digestive number one. Yum, yum. I honestly struggled with that poll. I just, I like biscuits a lot. But because I have celiac, that just makes it even harder for me and more expensive. But you know, we all love a bicky, right? I wonder what uh, poll we should do next of Twinkle Talks Top 3. You get in touch, let me know, and uh, we'll see what we come up with. But now that's over with, we're going to get right ahead with our main event of the episode. We have got the amazing Dr. Helen J. Williams in as a guest. She is the author of the Nursery World Professional Book of the Year 2022, Playful Mathematics. How exciting is this? And she has come today to talk to us all about how making maths fun and playful is not only really easy, but really important. Let's go and have a chat with her. Hello, Dr. Helen Williams. We'll call you Helen. Thank you so much for joining me today uh, on the podcast. I'm so excited to talk about you, your work, your book, the Nursery World Awards. I mean, there's just, there's so much to talk about, but I'll stop for a minute. Why don't you introduce yourself to our wonderful listeners if they don't know you already? Yes. Hi, uh, Sean. It's it's, uh, great to be invited. So thank you for that. I'm I'm quite (laughs) old now and I started teaching a long time ago and I started as a reception teacher having trained to work with three to eight year olds. I've actually worked 
with three right up through the primary range during my career. And I think that I, I went to mathematics because I was fascinated with the, what the sense my young children in my first reception class were making what sense they were making of the maths they were being presented, which was often very dull. And I was enlivened by a television program, which was out at the time on maths, which was completely revolutionary, called Leapfrogs. And it was on... Yes! (laughs) I remember! You probably... Did did you see any of them? That would be embarrassing. As a child, (laughs) probably, maybe. Yes, I did. I'm just like showing my age now, but yes, I did. (laughs) It was just the best. If it's the same one... I'm talking about was the best thing and I used to record it on a video um, and my class at that time when I started looking at it I had year threes and um we start we used to watch it and then do some of the tasks that they suggested in the program and I used to love getting engaged with them with that and that really started me off thinking well the maths I had at school wasn't really like this so how different can it you know how different this is and how different it felt like I was actually doing it rather than being done to Mm. but it started there and then when I when I then moved into reception I sort of with those thoughts in mind I sort of went forward and joined a maths association and I've been working sort of independently for the last oh gosh uh, older than my children 30 years I think I've been more or less independent I've been in school for some part-time work and working independently outside working with practitioners and adults on extending their maths curriculum to be more interesting so I've been doing that for a long time so now I'm sort of semi-retired but really busy (laughs) you are I mean you wrote I mean this is not the only book you've written but your most recent book has won a nursery world award please tell us all about how that came about I tell you, I I was so surprised. I, I hadn't even heard of the Nursery World Awards. I mean, that, actually, I did hear of them last year because a colleague of mine uh, won Practitioner of the Year, and I thought, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And then um, I, I was asked by somebody to support a book that was being put in for the Professional Book of the Year Award, another book, a maths book, by Di Chilvers, which is a very good maths book. Yeah. And I wrote some support for that and a review of it. And then my publisher said, I think we'll put your book in for it. And it, and uh, so I didn't think any more of it, really. And then it was a finalist. It's like, right, this is exciting. <laughs> and then there was an invitation to the event, which was <gasps> just very exciting. But I was supposed to be on holiday, so I wasn't going to go. And just some people said to me, Helen, I really think you should go. So I moved my flight. I moved my flight twice, actually, in order to be there. And it was just incredible and I, and I and that was enough for me just to be yeah. there and um Mine Concubar was there and lots of other people I was gonna say were there any like famous people there <laughs> Sue Allingham was there David Wright who got the um oh my god got, yeah he got the Lifetime Achievement Award yeah and, and, and there were loads and loads of it was uh, it was it was very glitzy and lovely and um it, and the food was brilliant and it was just fun <laughs> a great party <laughs> night out lots of great practitioners doing amazing things in their yeah. settings of sitting on our table just fascinating and it was really uplifting and I didn't think any more and when they announced my name I was stu- I was not for six I, <laughs> I really was not for six it was an absolute shock and what is so lovely is that a maths book got it right because I you know maths for everybody was not a great positive experience people you know if I if I really don't want anybody to sit next to me at a dinner party if I say I do something to do with maths I used to move away you know <laughs> it's just been a whole thing right the way through yeah. my career. so for a maths book to get that award um is is lovely for maths early maths yeah really it's massive yeah, but the thing is, right, so obviously I've read your book and you, I can instantly see why. And this is, as soon as you got that award, I was like, oh my gosh, I must I must message her. I would love her to chat about her book because, there, I mean, there are just so many great things. So listeners, we're going to put a link to her book in the episode description so you can have a look as well. It just, it's so practical uh, for me. And I've said this to you several times, but not only do you suggest activities and practical activities as well that we can do that gets children off their feet, gets children in involved in actual practical real life maths you give examples you know you've been to schools and you say you've given them setups and activities to try out and you've got the pictures and it's just it's really handy and I know it's one of those books that practitioners can have on you know on their shelf and just pick out and be like oh you know what can we flick through and there's so many things that they can take from it so the first thing is obviously we love maths (laughs) as you can tell but 
as you've already touched upon, maths as a subject, I mean, sometimes you just need to say the word, don't you? And people go, you know, and it, it, they tighten up. So what, what do you think it is? Why do you think practitioners are so fearful about teaching maths? I think, oh gosh, um, I think it stems from the fact that people think that maths is about getting one correct answer. Yes. And so they're, so you're fearful of being put on the spot and made to look silly by not knowing what that answer is. And I think for many of us, and certainly for myself, at points during my school life, I was made to feel silly for having given the wrong answer. And so I think that's definitely where it stems from. So that fear. So one of the things that I think then what that contributes to is is our feeling that we don't we aren't that confident in that area. So we, so we very we tighten up what we do with those children to make sure that nobody makes a mistake or you know I'm not getting anything wrong. So I think that that's a really big problem. And you know, working I love working with practitioners. Um, I absolutely love it. And the most exciting thing for me is exactly it, it correlates to working with children is when you see the realization and the excitement in you put something out and the pra- practitioners get excited about it and they go I can't wait to see if my children do this or say this once you get through that crack Mm. you start focusing on the children rather than the maths really really Mm. we focus on the children what will they do with this what do they say come back let's have a look at it and let's look at the maths now through look at it through a maths lens approach it through the children once you can do that I think practitioners loosen up and start enjoying it themselves because you know it isn't any different to doing a bit of science with some kids or or any other area really so I think that that is and I think there's a complete misunderstanding about what maths is and I agree over emphasis on number there are far too many worksheets filled in which is literally just coloring not really maths at all whereas maths really should be about involving children in thinking and predicting and making statements about what they think will happen if they change something And it has to encompass that wide curriculum of, you know, their spatial thinking as well as their numerical thinking, because that's very supportive of the numerical thinking. And of course, all that spatial awareness can happen actively and link up to your communication development and your physical development and all of those other things that are the prime areas of the early years. So, um, yeah. I love it because you're so passionate about it. And I think that's what we need. I think you're quite right about the attitude. If we're focused on the pressure and the math side of it, our kids pick up on it, don't they? And like you yeah. say, if if we put something out that we're really excited about, they're going to feed off of that energy. Yeah. And like you say, a lot of us, when we were children, you know, our own experiences perhaps weren't as exciting as we know we can make it. And so it's it's really difficult to try and find that inspiration if you yourself didn't didn't have it. But that's exactly what your book provides. And that's why I love it. And you touched on something there, which I think also really helps or backs up why people are so afraid of maths. What are the misconceptions? Because I think what what people think maths is, is also something that's feeding into it. So what are the big things that you see that are like, wait, hang on a minute? (laughs) Well, I think that one of the things is that it's okay to say, oh, I don't know. You know, I think that that is a children might say something and I think we panic. And we think, oh, gosh, I don't know. I don't know what shape that is. I don't know the name of that shape. Or I don't know what I'm supposed to do. You can say, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to write that down a minute because I don't really know. I need to think about that. And you're modelling that idea of finding out and thinking about things as well. So I think it's okay to do that. The other misconception is that numbers are the most important of, ever, of everything. And we've got to crack on with that. And, and especially with children who are experiencing difficulties, we just do more and more of the number. Right. More and more number. Uh, so more and more things that they're finding hard. <laughs> um, and I think that's a huge misconception. And I don't think that is helped at the moment by some of the material that's being put out sort of centrally um, from various places. So we know from research, not just one piece of research, we know from research for over the last 10, 15 years and from all over the world that children's spatial thinking is not only supportive of the numerical thinking, but is a greater predictor of later achievement. And by spatial thinking, I mean their ability, a child's ability to visualize, visualize something. So in other words, if you're doing a Lego model, you know, you're looking for that block um, rather than just grabbing any block. I need a block that's got six blobs on the top or whatever it is that you're thinking. You know, that ability to to think in your head, 
And you can see that that would link to your numerical ability because as children get older, you have to manipulate abstract things in your head and numbers and amounts in your head. So that ability to do it practically, to do a jigsaw, and instead of just whacking the pieces in, and see, <laughs> is, to, is to be looking at the space and, and, and helping the child by saying things like... Um, Ooh, I think you need one with two straight edges. So that, that thing that it's not hit and miss, that we can actually, we can think about and visualise what it is that we need. Those abilities to to work like that spatially, because we live in a 3D world and we work spatially all the time, you know, putting the stuff in the boot of the car, turning into a parking space, obvious ones. You know, we can do it. We have those and helping children see that and develop those the confidence and their realization that's what they're doing um, is going to not only support their mathematical development but it, it it does predict your later wider mathematical achievement that's really interesting and I suppose I think like pattern oh yes spotting patterns is a big one I suppose isn't oh, it yes. as well yeah that's the other one yeah pattern is pattern I mean that's the research that comes from initially from the states from Rittle Johnson and her colleagues and Sue Gifford has replicated some of these findings in this country and there are some open access articles on that um which I can point you to uh, easy easy to read um that research was looking specifically at, at repeating patterns how young children cope with those and the and the thing that seems to be important is that they can identify the what they call the unit of repeat so the child is able to see that the 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 unit that is repeating within this pattern is red red blue green or whatever it is um or you know i don't know grape grape melon something and (laughs) um, so in other words you've got a whole load of information and you're extricating one small bit from it and if you think mathematically actually that is what we have to do when you work mathematically with any you have to be able to look at all the information and extract the bit you need so uh, that work on on repeating patterns predicting what happens and what patterns work as the children began to call it so they didn't just look at linear patterns they started to look at patterns that went round uh, a perhaps around the edge of a paper plate so of course that is an extra dimension that because the pattern has got to finish eat itself and work as the children started got is, is very powerful stuff and such lovely stuff to do with children yeah so yeah patterns patterns and spatial awareness spatial reasoning are those two things uh, i'm really lucky enough to be a member of the early childhood mathematics group so uh, a link to their website would be great we have all sort of loads of free guidance and materials on there but we have a huge section on spatial thinking which we're calling our spatial reasoning toolkit and on there there's all sorts of videos like short videos to explain aspects of it because I think people think well I don't know what that is it's kind of shape and it's space so it's shape but not just knowing the names of shapes it's about understanding how they're put together and how they're taken apart and their qualities and space which is how we are in relation to other things in the world so we've got a whole toolkit there. There's um, oh, there's lovely posters, all sorts on there. So I love that. Yeah, that's a good group. It's a good, you know. I'm really we work really hard on trying to expand people's view of yeah of what mathematics is. Can anyone join, is. or is it like do you have a newsletter as well, or like how do how do people who want to learn get access to this? <laughs> well, I think we no, we don't do a newsletter. We're all volunteers. <laughs> we've just got we've got this website, which are our lovely. We've got a lovely volunteer that keep trying to keep that up to date. I've got we're on uh, Twitter as the oh great. Uh, what are we on there as e childhood maths? I think is our is our angle on there, and so we're always adding things to it. So see, this is the thing, isn't it? Because I feel like when you say you know things are always adding to it, I feel like that's kind of how maths is evolving as well. Because I feel like, mm. uh, for example, your misconceptions about you know it's all about number within number. I think there is another misconception that, oh, just because they can count to 10, <laughs> yeah. they understand number. And obviously that's not, you know, that's not the case. And exa- exactly what you said just then about shape, just because they learn the names of the shape or they can recognize shape, that doesn't mean they have a deep understanding of shape. It's so much more than that. Like you say, it's the space that we fill, how things are put together. And it's a lot deeper than that, which is already, I think, a great start in terms of teaching math. So in your view, in your experience, you've, you've done so many things, you know, you've been to so many different settings. What would be your favourite or most effective ways to teach maths and all of those concepts? 
Oh, cracky, that is a huge question. It's a, it's a big question, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think you need some... I, I don't think you can do it without manipulative. So that is actual things that you actually have, or not things on a PowerPoint, not things on a worksheet. You know, they have to be real things that children can pick up and move about. That's the first thing. If you haven't got manipulatives of any sort, you really can't teach it. And with manipulatives, that might be something that is non-standard, so like loose parts, things that are all different shapes and sizes, like you might get with pine cones or Mm. or whatever. And then there are um, structured manipulatives, which I think probably some of those are pretty essential because those have been designed for children to see the relationships between things. So whilst they play with those things, they you can then have a discussion about what they're noticing about how they mm. fit together and, and the relationships between those things so so I think for me I think loose parts I mean that is a word that wasn't around when I was in my own no class, but it, they I, I mean I did use lots of bits yeah <laughs> we just called them bits yeah and also, I used to always say there's not even you haven't got enough you know when I was teaching people would say you know put out a picture of five apples and say count those apples well that's not a lot duller than that really and well I used to say well you need a whole heap of apples you need a whole heap of apples uh, or whatever they are and say oh can you go and get me five let's get five out because that will tell you much more about that child's ability to count a correct amount yeah and and and, and also give that label for that quantity of five if you're just pointing to a row of five things on a sheet or a powerpoint um so i think that i always had things and i always used to think i needed a whole heap of things because that would lead to so so much more exploration so children would count to amounts that i wouldn't expect them to and and so i think the whole loose parts thing is is lovely because i think it does bring all that around children's ability to explore lay them out organize them line them up will help us have discussions starting with the child like you know well have you got more have you got more cones or pebbles how do you know do you think all those sticks will reach all the way across the playground you know your pile of sticks would they reach all the way over there you know those sorts of discussions yeah. and you can see the child is going to yeah I think my sticks are going to reach right <laughs> <laughs> you, know, it's just, you just children like collecting things they like lining things up they like organizing things so and and that those are really good bases for starting mathematical explorations And in terms of structured manipulatives, I think there are a few that I would have as essential in any setting. Which ones? Uh, Well, I would have, uh, I'd have the community play things, unit blocks. Mm, Yeah. I think if you haven't, if you've got those, those are remarkable piece of equipment in terms of the mathematical language and exploration that can happen because they're all unit related. They fit together so that two of the um, sort of uh, wedge shaped ones make are the same volume as the rectangular block the rectangular prism block and all of that and and to if you store those carefully children do as much maths getting them out and putting them away as they do when they're building with them so I think they're essential and that's the whole spatial reasoning exactly thing. but and, 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 my, and my number one would be quiz and air rods oh yes they are good and rods are related by size but they're not marked they're unmarked rods so the little white rods 10 of those little white ones fit into a long orange rod but they're not marked specifically because although I can number them one to ten when I'm working with older children I have called the orange rod one yes of course which means we can talk about decimals yeah and percentages and fractions yeah and fractions like we can look at halves so I would have a set of Cuisinaire because even with very young children, you can do, you can build with that, and they can start thinking about how the rods relate to one another. You can play things like missing rod, <laughs> you know, which is the one in this sequence that's missing. So I think those two, if you have, if I only had to allow to have two, I would mm. have those two. See, I think you've picked up on some really good points because it doesn't matter, like you say, what you teach or how you teach, but. The, I think the key word is exploration there because mm. I mean myself included when I you know when you think of teaching maths you think of it like you say as rigid as there's one answer and this is the method that you need to get there even if there's a several methods it's you no know, you need to learn these methods and it's very uh, well it's very rigid but mm. actually and I think especially in early years as well it's so free there is that chance to explore it more than other year groups in some ways because like you say with the resources that you get with the loose parts you could have a 
I don't know, literally a box of leftover toys that haven't been tidied up, right? And there's loads of different things in there. And it could be, you could be talking about amount or how many bits of Lego we got in here, where does it need to go? Or, you know, how many dollies did we forget to put away this, you know, and how big they are. You can talk about size, you know, they all relate to each other, like you say. And with the, you know, keeps and air rods and things. Yes, it can talk about number and quantity, but they're different lengths as well. Also, they're different colours. There's pattern that you just get to explore it and ask those questions. Oh, what do you notice? Oh, you know, yeah. and that's the exciting part. So and another thing you've said as well is like, I think we all get stuck in that trap of being able to play with math, but then to do it, we always somehow end up with a worksheet or, you know, writing numbers as evidence or things like that. So we want to make it more playful. How how can we make maths learning more playful? Okay, so there's a couple of things that I that I thought about from what you were saying that is will also answer this question. And the first is I think what we probably don't make quite enough of those incidental moments. So children take uh, Nunes and Bryant's research, so it's three to five years, to learn about linking a quantity with a numeral because that often when we see numerals in the outside world, they're labels. You know, when you yeah. see 15 bus, it's not because there are 15 people on it. <laughs> yeah. It is just that's a label for it. So we know which bus to catch. So so those incidental moments, like you were saying, so if you're having snack and you, you know, we could say, oh, can you put the cups out? You could say, can we put five cups out? You know, make sure you use those moments. You know, that if we Start thinking like that. Those numbers are happening all the time. The other thing which links to what you're saying here, how do we make the maths playful and what's the most effective way? I think those are, that's linked. And I think the most effective way to get young children involved in learning mathematics is to start with some sort of open exploration. And, and the teaching comes later. We start with that exploration. And I am noticing what the children are saying to me. I'm observing that and using that to build my teaching on later. So the most ineffective way is to start with your teaching and then have to mop it up because you've lost half a dozen of them or even one of them, actually. So that the most effective way is to start from the exploration so that and that is playful because that's what they're used to doing have a look at these do how many look here are some pots and some coins how many coins fit in this pot how many can we get in you know what do you what you how many in yours you know and you're thinking oh those children right we need to do some team counting or we need to do some work where and and uh, so I think that way round, switching it round is the most effective change you can make so that is playful in itself I think and the other Mm. the other side of it is that us as adults is how we respond and how we interfere with what's happening and how we choose to do that so we we shouldn't be too quick to overcorrect. we can make a note of something and think we need to do some work on that but try not to overcorrect. just make a note of that and be careful to allow the children the space to explain. So you might think, well, I don't know, she's got the wrong end of the stick there. But I'm going to say, ooh, um, Shana, can you say a little bit more about that? Tell me, explain that to me a bit, you know, or tell me a bit. So I can just get beneath it. So I'm not assuming there's a mistake there or I'm worrying about the fact there might be a mistake there. So I think those two things is, and I try, I do tackle those things in my book. I've got a chapter on adults and what we say and what we do. That I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying that it's much more um, enjoyable as an adult mm. can make that switch instead of going away and worrying about, oh, no, not th- you know, none of them got that. Well, they're not, you know, let's do it the other way around. Let's, let's start the other way around. And I call that in my book preparation rather than planning. So I think if I've spent hours planning a lesson for want of a better word for it a session I'm not going to really change what I do very much because I I plan that to the nth degree and I've thought really hard about but I need to leave space in my planning so I call that preparation I'm preparing but I'm ready for some funny thing you know some other things yeah. to happen I think that is a really important shift to make as a practitioner I think and we do have the space in the early years to do that actually we absolutely do yeah now is the time, Helen. Now is the time to do that. <laughs> now, is the, now is absolutely the time. You meant, and you also mentioned, you know, writing numbers and things. You see, we've got a piece on our early childhood maths group website on 
children's informal mathematical recording. And children can record maths in their own way. And through that, I can introduce the numerals or whatever thing I want to introduce. So scoring for games, you know, if you've got skittles or something going on outside or any game, really, I put, I say, here you go, here's your scoreboard. Here's a couple of pens. Keep track, you know, and let's just see what I get. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, And then we can bring that board in when we've got a bit of carpet time. And I go, hey, Shana, what were you doing here? Yeah, what was going on out there? And we're using that. They're reading the recording. They're interpreting it. And I'm saying, oh, next time, maybe keep two columns so that you can see who won, who scored what. Try that one later and see if that is easier for us to see who got most beanbags in the tub. You know, that you can sort of introduce, introduce it more sensitively yeah. rather than he hates recording sheep <laughs> this is where you write your twos yeah and then we can do the we can do the kind of like and i can quietly say to you sean try and get your twos all the way right way around try and get those the right way around this morning because you're really good at that if you try hard you know and not worry too much about you know once you've got anxiety coming in there either practitioner anxiety or child anxiety you know you've got to back off because you know what we're like when we're anxious we can't no. I think what you've touched on there as well which I find really interesting is flipping it on its head like we don't need to focus on the end result the answer in inverted commas is actually the process mm. which is the most important like you say because example with the tallying it's like well, actually, what did they do there? Because it might look like gobbledygook to us, but actually there is a system. You know, they might be going down instead of across or mm. instead of writing their names, they might do a scribble of that child's favourite colour and that's the representation for them of that child's score. Unless you give them the freedom to do that, to explore that and give them that time, then you'll never understand what their process is. And actually that's more important than I would say in terms of the Mm, result because it's it's those patterns and it's like okay so this is how the child sees the world or this is how the child sees that problem so now I know their thought process in 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 trying to solve it and that's basically what maths is isn't it yes well it is it is and I mean you're right and um, I can easily say to that child look I know something called tallying which I can show you which will help you count up yeah. you know you can introduce those um, more the, the sort of formal stuff as you go along but yes maths is about solving problems and a problem is is something that you don't really know the answer to and you <laughs> you're trying to find out yeah. and children will have different ways of solving those problems and that that as you rightly say is what's going to stand them in good stead as they go on forward it, you know through their school life or through their life actually. Yeah. yeah and I think as well what's unique about maths is that it's just as important to learn how to make mistakes than it is to get the right answer. So like, you know, in that process of trial and error, it might take a child three or four times to get to the correct amount or, you know, whatever the the problem solving may be. But they've learned so much through, okay, well, I tried this way. Oh, actually, I've still got a couple left over or let me try something else. Or, Or when I did it this way, this part of it was right, but this part of it was wrong. How do I make them get together? And I think that's a really unique skill in maths that is just as important is finding out the right answer, so to speak. So, I mean, there are loads and loads of wonderful activities in, in your book and in you know in your practice around. But what are your what are your favourite kind of sort of activities that you've used to kind of support support the things that we've been talking about? What are you, what are your favourite? Okay. I mean, the things you're talking about there really about the characteristics of effective teaching. Yeah, and the, the children's resilience and sticking to a problem and their ability to review how it went, and that can happen by themselves or as a group. So I might we all might sit down. So one of my favourite activities was to say, "Oh, okay, what happened?" over there on the block carpet I could see you were trying to make a wall that was tall enough tall as I don't know Shana and what you know what what had it go I mean what what went well what did, what would you do okay you can have another go so what are you going to start with today that that helping them that business of review so that, that the fact that your you, the mistake is at the end of it mm, you know? exactly but I, you know otherwise I love I love sharing activities I think those are I mean I've mentioned this recently to somebody else and children understand sharing uh, completely fair sharing yeah so I love those and I love the ones where um I think is in the book but I've said it many times before is the pirate's gold idea you know two pirates yeah pile of gold can the pirates have a fair share of gold each and that's you can see what happens how they solve that one and then you go oh here, here you go pirate number three here he is oh he'd like some of that gold as well can that same amount be shared fairly between between three parts what if we had four pirate you know what amounts of gold so you can see that is a lovely exploration so those sort of sharing ones 
I think I, I, I love doing those. I, I absolutely adore doing those. Um, I also like, I can't remember, I can't remember if it's in there or whether it's <laughs> I've got a set of, and I, I absolutely get at the moment particularly that it is very difficult to use foodstuffs for yeah. tasks. But I do have a very old collection of butter beans that are sprayed gold on one side. And so just having those on a big, beautiful cloth, a heap of those where they can run their hands through them. And then we can start they line them up they look for big ones and small ones and then we start shaking them and seeing how many land gold up and how many land not gold up that's a lovely you know if somebody says to me come in tomorrow I'd grab that bag yeah or I'd grab the pirates because I know those two in themselves which you know I, I know I get some takers and I know we get some interesting things happening so yeah those ones I think anything with a die putting a dice with anything Yes. You know, dice and some stuff in the sand tray and see what, you know, how could we make this game a bit more interesting uh, and seeing what they come up with. I was going to say, I remember when I was in nursery, if they were doing something, I would just maybe introduce a dice because kids are always fascinated with dice. So you'd have the big ones, wouldn't you? And I'd always have them. Yeah. And so they'd be doing something and they'd want the dice. They could be even in the role play area. It doesn't have to be anything to do with maths. And I'd be like, yeah, okay, go and have the dice. And I wouldn't tell them how to play a game. Just watch what they come up with because they know Yes. that dice are there and that rules need to be created for some reason mm. and at the end of it there's either points or people win or something happens so they understand the concept of what a dice does but just not telling them what to do with them and just letting them go is so actually really fun and I've had some of my best observations just by doing that yeah I think it is a very good assessment <laughs> opportunity um, the other any any activity that involves hiding and revealing, I think, mm. is another one, which is a winner. So hiding an amount and saying, you know, some appear, how many are still left inside, or 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 anything where you're hiding. Kim's game where you have a tray. Yes, yes. Uh, and you you know you you have a glimpse of what's on the tray, and then you cover it up and what was there, what's moved, what, when we're taken away, anything like that. Uh, my favourites because that works on our ability to visualize and our working memory exercises our working memory so anything anything hiding and revealing collecting rolling and taking or rolling and moving I think it was uh I can't think who said it to me but she said I think the whole of the curriculum could be tackled through games and I thought yeah right I think we need to stick that on a t-shirt Helen and just post it to number <laughs> no, 10. The one I want on the t-shirt is um is the roller skating quote that I start the book with maths could be like roller skating but usually it's like being told to come in and tidy your room <laughs> that is so true I love that that's the t-shirt I want <laughs> I, I'll buy 10 thank you <laughs> but also I think a lot of what you've touched upon as well is in terms of the activities the children are involved and actually what they're being asked to do is to actually solve real life problems and I think that's a really important thing for everything not just maths but especially for maths because it has real world applications and if the children feel like doing the maths affects something to do with them like you say sharing some coins or getting snack ready if it has a real world application they're going to get involved with it more so we're going through a cost of living crisis perhaps settings might not be able to to buy the structured resources what real life resources or activities can we do with our children that teach the exact same concepts uh, well I think when we say real life I think for some children it can be pretend real life can't it so yeah I think that things like I mean I did my PhD was looking at role play and maths and I think there's so many opportunities there but it's pretend um, but it, it is adapting real life or you can have fantasy real life yeah tasks. I think it's uh, Freudenthal who the Dutch define real as being real for the child it doesn't have to be real exactly you know, using a credit card or doing all you know, it's all, <laughs> yeah. it needs to be real for the child and I think that's the that's the touchstone really so I think there's lots of things you can collect that, that you can use for maths that cost absolutely nothing I mean I've been scrunching over nuts walking my dog <laughs> yeah you know, and things like you see jigsaws they they can be expensive maybe not in charity shops so much and if there's a missing piece well that's kind of like oh a learning point yeah <laughs> Um, but I mean, you can cut up greetings cards and cereal packets to make jigsaws. Yes. That's a really nice thing to do if you're a, at home with a child. You know, once they've seen you do it, they're going to want to do it themselves. And you yeah. can cut it up into loads of tiny pieces and find how difficult it is to bully really <laughs> So uh, there is there is a lot we can do with what we've got. And I think 
the other thing I see sometimes is that you've got a few of something. So I think knock on the person, your colleague, and say, I've only got a few of these. What have you got? You can have these. I can have some of those. You know, do a bit of a swap there so you've got more of whatever it is. Because if the interlocking cubes are great for quite a lot of things, no good just having a few of those. You need loads of those. So you need to do a bit of a trade. So, yeah, uh, you know, natural stuff. I mean, stone stuff. You haven't got to buy those things. No. I was just thinking as well, like, other activities that we do that are naturally mass anyway, like going to the shops. Oh, yes. Or, counting yeah. oh, things. Absolutely. Or how many oranges are we going to buy today? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or like doing the gardening. Like you say, you don't yeah. need to buy things for that. We've already got the pots. We've already got yeah. the seeds. We've already got a bag of soil. Yes. You know, get the scales out and weigh that. You know, there's so many yes. things that you can yeah, do. Yeah, there are. And baking, obviously. Yes, perfect. Um, and also the thing I think, uh, map making, you know, we walked to the post the post the letter. Can you draw a map of our, where we went? Yes. Draw a map, that idea of having a map. And then we go out with the map and see if we can follow it. Oh, you forgot to draw the corner in you know looking at maps so looking at things and talking about when you're sitting in the car there's the, all those things are sitting there what does that mean you know 30 what yeah <laughs> What is that 30 watt just having discussions about those things around us is, is a lovely thing to do you know with you with your own children it's lovely and as a child minder easily exactly I think is as well like you can double up and get them to do jobs around the house like washing you know when you put your washing away well the socks come in pairs you've got to go find the other pair that's maths learning and they're doing the washing as well I mean it saves you a job <laughs> <laughs> We've had some amazing questions from our listeners as well, because obviously maths is a massive topic for practitioners, childminders, parents, everybody. So we told our listeners, we've got Dr. Helen coming on. This is the opportunity. This is a guru of maths play. <laughs> what do you want? You know, ask her anything. So we've got some really good ones. So the first one in maths, and I agree with this, it's very easy to get stuck in doing written work and worksheets to prove ability. Like we do all these fun activities, like you say, but then when it comes to assessment week or something, you know, there's some on a sheet and that's how we prove and evidence that a child has got a specific concept so how can we change that how can we evidence mathematical learning in a more active way okay so yeah I thought this was a really good question and um I might be a bit controversial here but I'm gonna say it anyway there shouldn't be assessment week there certainly shouldn't be assessment week in the early years because that's not how we learn and that's not how we best evidence how, how our children are learning or how we best build on what they're doing yeah. through our next teaching episode so worksheets and written work does not show you the full ability of an early years child because that is lagging behind what they can actually do and how they're actually thinking. So if we really want to find out what they're able to do, I need to observe them doing some of these things yeah. that I've set up. So when I when I talk about in my book about being prepared to teach, some one of those things is being aware of the potential of that activity so that I'm listening to the children and I'm listening out for some things. Those are the assessment points. So I might be listening for a child's ability to say 13, 14, 15, 16, maybe. So I'm deliberately put a number of items that fit in the pot or, whatever, or the purse or whatever that allows me to see if they can do that because you know 13 14 15 all sound a bit thwith, 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 yes you know? they always struggle so I want maybe I'm maybe I'm going to be um focusing on that so I'm when I'm doing these activities there are occasions where I'm thinking I'm going to look out for that because that for me is something I need to know about so there we go so on our um on our early childhood maths group website we do have a new area called chips which stands for children's performance indicators something like that and on there we have put quick and easy and informative ways to check children's numerical understanding and these are based in what we've read in research as being predictive of later achievement so on there there are easy ways and little videos of children doing these things really tell us about children's current attainment so I don't like the word ability because I think that's fixed. Yeah. So I would say their current attainment, and this is what those little tasks, or the, some of them are just, you're doing the task and it's something to say, mm. and they're all been trialed, they're all based in research, and they will tell you, they will absolutely tell you what the children are able to do. Now, in terms of evidence for that, I would think any 
school worth their salt should accept my professional judgment for that I record that in the way I need to in order that I teach effectively mm-hmm. and anybody that's up being asked for three three examples of this and three examples of that that has been said very clearly that isn't the way to go it's yes. been said by Oxford, it's been said by many people so I think we have to say a polite no this is why I'm not doing it and I think uh, we have to be very articulate about what we are doing in order to build on children's learning because that's what assessment is for I'm assessing them so I build my teaching on that so we have to be articulate about that and strong or you know creatively non-compliant I would say (laughs) oh I like that oh I'm gonna save that (laughs) (laughs) I think I was bringing back memories of when I was in reception and several occasions it was a you need to have at least two pieces of maths written work for every child every week Mm. and it was just bonkers bonk yeah so I'm glad that like you say in terms of the reforms and things that documenting in that very rigid way is now Mm. no longer the norm and I Mm. hope people listening are also feeling confident to do that if you're not yet Dr Helen has said it herself and I'm saying (laughs) doctor because that's the bit that will get the SLT a doctor (laughs) in maths has said this quote (laughs) I mean I think the the, sometimes those requests come from their own fear yes Uh, so, so if you could get them on your side by saying look I'm not doing that because, but I am doing this. Please just come and watch me in this class with these children. And then we could talk about what it tells us about what they know. That would be, and all you need to ask them to come for is 20 minutes, really. That would be fine. And then you'd find 10 minutes, you know, on the stairs, which is where most conversations happen in a school, uh, discussing it. So I think that that would be my way forward. And then if you're still getting it, on and on and on. I think it's time to look for another job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're, <laughs> really? we're paving the new way here. So you know, if they're not if they're not on board, go find a new ship. Yep, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> Our next question is also talking about um, leadership as well. So this next question says, my head is concerned about the new curriculum changing from focusing on numbers to twenty down to numbers to ten. Mm. I agree. I I still can't quite get my head around why we've made the gap wider in terms of year one. They're supposed to know numbers up to 100 so Mm. should we still go up to 20 and if so how do we do it and how do we deal with that Mm. so it's interesting is it so I think that the issue here is about the understanding of what an early learning goal is and what the educational program is so a lot of people haven't accessed the educational program and certainly SLT probably haven't so I would be printing that off and in there it's a much wider description of mathematics and it's got some good stuff in there about children being confident and interested and so I think that's the first thing I think this is now time for my fried egg metaphor Shana actually I do share with people I'm intrigued and so so before I say that the other thing is the early learning goal is something for us to look at at the end of the reception year the end of the very end of the of the foundation stage that's what it's for it's not to be taught two in that way if you like so my friday metaphor is so there's stuff that i do with my children which i would call the yoke which is what i really want them to have a good grasp of by the time they leave me and that would be numbers to 10 they have to absolutely i would want all of my children i realize we're going to have children in that inclusive community that might not manage that but that is my aim and then you have the white of the egg which is stuff we've met and which will include numbers to 100 i don't expect them all to have a working a solid working knowledge of all the relationships in that area like I would do in the yoke bit and they've changed the yoke if you like to be numbers 10 because it is absolutely certain that we were moving a bit too quickly children didn't have that good grasp of all the ways like I said to you it takes three to five years for children to link a numeral to a quantity Uh, we didn't have that we didn't have that solid focus on that but what it doesn't mean is we don't go above 10 and Every single early year setting should have a hundred square up, right? Because we can't even have the conversations about the numbers if we don't have them there. So it's about what I'm focusing on in terms of getting them to nail it, and it's the experiences I provide to enrich those children so that they move on with that rich experience which is nailed a little bit further up that is the difference I think that's why it's, it's changed 
of course, we should be still going up to 20, but we should be going over 20 because those those numbers between 10 and 20 are the most difficult ones to learn because there's no, the pattern is there when you see them, which is why you should have 100 square up. But if you say them, there is no pattern. If no. we learn 1T, 1T1, 1T2. Yeah, which they do. <laughs> uh, which, is, which is fine. And I've done that with children. I've counted like that and they thought it was very funny. And I've, But when you start going above 20 and looking up, when you say 40, they all go, ah, 40. Because they suddenly realised four T four tens. Yeah. You know, with older children, we've I've done that. So I think that we have to go over ten. But I think we need to think about our experiential curriculum and the stuff. I want to be able to say to my year one teacher, they're solid on this. Mm. As far as I am aware, they're solid on this. We've we've met this. That's what that's about. And, and when I read, my teachers say things like, I, I, "We're not allowed to do anything above ten until." I don't know, October or January, and you just think, I just want to cry because look at what those children bring with them. I can't think of many children who come to school without some, even children where you think they're, maybe their numerical home experience has not been as rich as others. They will say things like, my gran is 50. Yeah, even if you said like you're counting apples, like oh, we've got four apples, at least one child will go, I'm four. Yes. And I'm like, okay, great. What does, yeah. thank you. Like it, yeah. they'll know something. Yes. They will. So I think that we have to use that building from what they know. So her head is right to be concerned about it because it's not about restricting what we do with the children. It's about that's the thing that is important for them to get a grip of in order to move on. And the reason there's a massive gap between what we expect in year one in reception is because the curriculum has never been written properly from the ground up. It's kind of come down. So we, we, we're left with all these anomalies, which are difficult to deal with. Mm. You know, you reminded me of a conversation I had with someone else. And she was explaining, she's called Jill. She was explaining about the Montessori approach. And she said something about maths. They focus on the digits zero to nine. Because once you learn the concept of those digits, yes. with place value, you can go anywhere. Yes. Yes. You can go up to thousands, hundreds of thousands, and they actively do in the Montessori approach. They absolutely do, yeah. And that's where you are making links between things. So that's why you can't just focus on 0 to 9. So you have to look at the large and how those digits fit in those larger numbers so that children can make links yeah. between those things. So uh, there's a New Zealand setting. Uh, somebody sent me a picture of, and I've used it when I've given talks, and people go, where'd you get one of those from i don't know somebody needs to make one wooden board and it's got it's got zero at the bottom and the numbers go up in size which is the right way round. i think they all run left to right and the numbers are all on discs and the discs fit on to hooks and so the children could take them off look underneath put the discs on or they can turn them round and they turn i think they're red on one side and blue on the other so you can look at all the numbers with fives in and what yeah. they were doing in that nursery frequently was turning all the numbers with three in or turning over all the numbers with four in because that was their number yeah. so having to be able to explore and play with something like that and you having a you know an, a lovely warm fuzzy maths chat like you would do a story <laughs> book with that is really really important for those children's number understanding and their confidence and their enjoyment yeah I honestly feel like I understand that statement a bit more now like in terms of the development matters and that change so hopefully our listeners will understand that as well and again SLT if they're worried does it mean we have to stop counting to 20 this is the categorical no it's not think of a fried egg (laughs) and our last question so this is from a parent perspective of course because we've got wonderful parents that you know children are exposed to so much learning at school they want to carry it on at home this parent asks my child doesn't appear to like or even engage with mathematics how can I make math learning at home more accessible and enjoyable Mm. so that's interesting so I would like to ask that parent why they think they don't like or engage with them and I would going to make a huge assumption here and think that it's quite a lot of perhaps a bit more formal maybe some workbooky type things so I would say no ditch that get out some board games you can do loads of counting with board games um, what the research into looking at a track game with young children is that if you so say for example we're playing snakes and ladders and you're on 10 if you roll a 3 instead of going 1, 2, 3 what's really helpful is if I go 11, 12, 13, that's what's really oh, So yeah. board games, loads of maths, counting on, counting back, looking at the numbers, where I'm going to land, where are you in. Lots of games have scoring on them that aren't actually maths games. So let the child do the scoring and find a way of doing it. Uh, jigsaws, I've mentioned, I think it's an untapped resource. <laughs> jigsaws, making your own jigsaws and putting them back together again. Cooking, weighing, baking, looking if you've got enough of everything. So all of those informal things 
I think, as a way to get started. And there's a lovely website called Enrich, which is run for yes. 25 years from Cambridge University. Use them quite a bit. Yeah, so they're re- they've got a parents section on there. And we've got an early year section on there, which I've contributed to. Once you get beyond that, I don't want to do anything, you can start looking at something that goes, oh, they've got a puzzle on here. Let's have a look. Mm. Throw at it together. So it, I think maths can be a lot about performing if you're not very careful and you get yourself in a tricky situation. So I think if it's seen as collaborative, side by side, let's have a little go at this. We have, uh, some of these are for much older children, but the Association of Teachers of Mathematics, who I've belonged to for the whole of my career, we, during lockdown, put together some things we called math snacks, which we wanted to enrich the diet of the children that were stuck at home looking at the screen the whole yeah. time. And so we've put some stuff on there, starters of using uh, using with coins and bits of paper cut up. Uh, simple games they're organized in terms of accessible for all and I would say they probably are from about late three up so they're starters that you could just have a go at together so I would say you know but don't start there start with the stuff you're doing at home already uh, how many sleeps is it till Christmas let's cross them off that's a great do you know what I was going to say advent calendars you know we've just had Christmas without even blinking an eye they wake up in the morning and they know what number they need to get their chocolate so like you say having a countdown like that is a great way to access it yeah to anything important you could have a countdown couldn't yeah, you yeah their birthday or when, when school starts yeah I love it. I honestly could stay here and talk about this forever because I just find it really fascinating. And I actually feel really inspired and thinking, oh, I want to go out. I want to go back into the class and do some math thing. But yeah, we've, you've got, we've got to let you go. But before that, can we please, please, please play a game? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, oh, what is it though? What is it? It's not a board game, I promise. We do a Would You Rather Teacher edition with all of our guests. Okay. So okay. a little bit of fun. <laughs> always the same would you rather tea or coffee oh it depends what time of day it is so tea in the morning first thing and like it's gonna be tea because i have more teas than coffees <laughs> any flavor tea or you just you like you like your builders yeah, i like builders tea uh, mainly but i also like a bit of mint tea now and again oh it is good yeah okay number two would you rather oh this is an interesting one would you rather teach time or volume and capacity oh volume and capacity because I get out there a huge water tray and just get thoroughly sodden and just lots of pouring and filling and yeah no I'd much rather teach that time is tricky it is it's abstract and we measure it in so many different ways so I actually do quite like teaching time but yeah that would my preference would be volume and capacity put your waterproof and your boots on get out there and uh yeah enjoy that have fun explore I love it I love it. I think I'm with you I love time especially you know there's those classic things when you teach children what's the time Mr Wolf and you know that's your introduction into time and things like that but like you say it's a little bit of an abstract concept whereas volume and capacity you can use anything doesn't doesn't have to be water it could be sand it could be uh, how many children can we fit in the cupboard today kids like it's just (laughs) you know lots of fun things like that so I agree I agree now this last one you're going to find really tricky because I did it on purpose would you rather have quinceanera rods or community plaything unit blocks? You cannot have both. I'm sorry. I'm not allowed both? No, you're not allowed. Oh. Well, I, if I was in a nursery or a setting, I would rather have the community playthings blocks. As the children get slightly older, I probably would choose Cuisinaire. So that's both. Congratulations, you can have both. It's fine. I was only joking. Of course, you can have both. <laughs> Helen, it's been so lovely to talk about you. Thank you so much. Your passion is just really inspiring and it's it's lovely to share your expertise with our listeners. So I really, really appreciate your time. I cannot wait to share all of the links um, about the association, your book. And I mean, seriously, listeners, please go and get her book because it's just a really easy read and it, it'll give you so many ideas, but it's also really affirming and being like, you know, actually, yeah, this is what we've always wanted to do with maths and this is how it works. And, you know, Helen gives a, yeah, you are doing the right thing in your book as well, which is great. So if we want to learn more, where can we find you? Uh, I only really go on Twitter for social media for work. So I'm at Helen JWC. I'm a member of the Early Child of Mass Group, so I'm, I'm often in that 
area producing stuff. I belong, I'm an associate of early education. So I'm recently actually, so I'm going to start webinars for them. That's, that's it really. What you've said has been very kind. Thank you very much for being so complimentary about the book, which I am really pleased with. So it's definitely something to be proud of. Seriously. I'm not just saying that. Like, you know, <laughs> it's really good. Thank you so much. And uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Yeah. Lovely Shana. Thank you very much. Ah, there we go. Thank you so much, Helen, for coming. It was such a lovely talk. And it's exciting to talk about maths and feel good about it, right? All of the links to the website she was talking about and to, of course, get her book is in the description of the podcast episode. So go and have a look in there to find out more. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Before you know it, it'll be February. Crazy. Have a great day and we'll see you soon. So that's it from today's episode. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you really enjoyed it. If you would like to get involved or would like to know more, come and find us on our social media sites. We have a Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest and TikTok account. All of the details will be in the description. And whatever you're doing, I hope you have a great day today.